Hi, everybody. I'm Maurice Samuels, the director of the Yale program for the study of anti-Semitism. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the next in our Benjamin and Barbara Zucker lecture series. It's an especially great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Adam Stern, back to Yale. Some of you remember that Adam was a postdoctoral fellow in our program a few years ago uh, when he was finishing up the book that he's going to be talking about today called Survival, a Theological Political Genealogy, which has now been released by University of Pennsylvania Press. And I just received my copy yesterday. Adam received his BA from Columbia, his MA from University of Chicago, and his PhD from Harvard in the study of religion. He's now an assistant professor of German at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he teaches courses on continental philosophy, Jewish thought, race and religion, secularism, political theology, translation theory, and media studies. He's going to be in conversation today with my colleague in the German department, Paul North, Paul is well known to most of you. Uh, among other things, he's the author of The Yield, Kafka's A Theological Reformation, published by Stanford in 2015, and a new book that I have to say sounds incredibly cool called Bizarre Privileged Items in the Universe, The Logic of Likeness, literally just out last week from Zone Books. So here's how things are gonna work. Adam is gonna present his book for about 10 minutes. Then Paul will engage him in conversation. Then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Please submit questions using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen, not chat. Uh, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation and Paul will ask them. And we're gonna finish promptly at six. So I will now uh, mute my video and hand it over to Adam. Thanks very much, Maury, for the kind introduction and uh, for hosting this event. And um, also to uh, uh, Paul North for agreeing to participate and to Anessa Laskova for helping to um, organize the event. Um, so as Maury said, I'm just gonna speak for a few minutes um, and then we'll um, uh, proceed with some discussion. So my book began with a few observations. The first was that survival occupies a prominent place within the modern secular political imagination. One need only think of the ways that the figure of the survivor has come to mediate the representation of current events, from genocide, climate catastrophe, and mass shootings, and disaster capitalism, to nuclear war, terminal illness, and perhaps in the post fortis present, everyday life. The second was that one could also identify a popular association between survival and Jews. Consider here not only the primacy accorded to the Holocaust survivor in our time, but also the extent to which survival underwrites the narration of both Jewish history, the survival of the Jews, and Jewish politics, the survival of the Israeli state. The question I wanted to ask was this, what if anything unites these two horizons? Could an examination of secular survival shed light on the issue of Jewish survival? And what could a study of Jewish survival tell us about the dissemination of survival more broadly? It became clear at an early stage in the research that any attempt to write this history would have to go beyond two major themes or areas, Darwinism and the Holocaust. Neither biology nor biopolitics seem to fully account for the theological and theological political resonances of the discourse on Jewish survival. My hunch, moreover, was that any theological political perspective on survival or Jewish survival would have to acknowledge the code sedimented by the asymmetric legacy of the Jewish Christian debate. So this gave rise to a hypothesis. Perhaps the link between Jewish survival and secular survival could be found in the invisible space between and in the very thing that otherwise managed to erase itself from view, the theological political history of Christianity. So this book interrogates the possibility that Latin Christianity has played an overwhelming role in shaping survival as a word, theme, and figure. More than that, the book is an attempt to follow the language of survival as it modulates, disarticulates, and rearranges a number of categorical distinctions between things like the secular, the Jewish, the Judeo-Christian, and the Christian. My strategy throughout is to read secular and or Jewish writers who have contributed or been made to contribute to the vast proliferation of survival talk. What I attempt to show 
is that these arguments, arguments that appear to highlight the secular and or Jewish signature of survival also consent and even demand attention to a different set of readings. Again and again, they return survival to a Latinate field of translation, to scenes of incarnation, passion, and resurrection, in short, to a stage dominated by the sovereign triumphalism of Christ's body. In this sense, the book is less a history of survival than a genealogy of its force. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by genealogy in a minute. It doesn't seek to address the whole of manif uh, survival's manifold uses, forge a linear narrative of its development or contextualize it in reference to a single historical event. Instead, the book moves backward from the present in order to rewrite the interpretive regimes that have dominated survival circulation. These genealogies of survival take major texts of 20th century philosophy, theology, and political theory as sites or occasions for collecting and constellating the scattered elements of survival's theological political archive. My hope in the book is that this will establish a framework for thinking survival as a Christian question, and in doing so, offer a critical assessment of Christianity's role in the constitution of modern secular and Jewish politics. Um, in order to frame all of these issues, I begin with a single question, which is who is speaking about survival? And the question seeks to highlight the genealogical objective of the study. My central purpose is not to affirm or deny survival. It's not to accept or reject its rhetoric or to say yes or no to the stances it defines. Instead, following um, Michel Foucault's famous definition of genealogy, or at least one of them, the task is um, to gauge the fact that survival is spoken about, to discover who does the speaking, the position and viewpoints from which they speak, uh, the institutions which prompt people to speak about survival, and which store and distribute the things that are said. In other words, I use genealogy as a scheme for provincializing the presumed universality of these codes. And ask how speech that has not always been self-evident to everyone has been made to look obvious and universal. My goal, that is, is to say that genealogy of survival is not a history of survival, but instead a way of asking where such a history might begin. What are survival's limits? What are its archives? What are its languages? And importantly in the book, what field of translations mediate its generalization? So the genealogy presented over the course of the book is at best a prologue to a history that has not really been written. Um, though restrictive and partial, the aspirational constraints acknowledge the need for a preparatory inventory of the major questions, texts, and structures of speaking that have made survival an identifiable element of our current political horizon. Um, in doing this, my preliminary hypothesis is that the genealogy of, genealogy of survival should begin with the specific political and theological political anxieties surrounding the survival of the Jews. In choosing this point of departure, I'm not arguing for a direct and transparent return to the Jewish textual tradition, but rather for a more complex encounter with the vicissitudes of history and translation that have contributed to the adoption of this language by both Jews and others. The political theorist Robert Meister um, motions in a helpful direction here, I think, by speculating that the politi political prominence of Jewish survival is as much about Jews as it is about the Christian West and the history of the Jewish question that goes as far back as Paul. Why are there still Jews? Now, this insight could take the genealogy of survival in a number of directions. On the one hand, a shared concern with Jewish survival could serve as a means of reconciling the commonalities of a Judeo-Christian tradition that runs from the Bible to the present day. On the other hand, survival could also be an opportunity to explore the historical grammar of concepts underlying secularism. Critics of secularism like Talal Assad, for instance, um, have argued that the Judeo-Christian heritage assumed by modern secularity is actually a retrospective reconstruction whose vision of unity has particular political stakes. In Assad's word, uh, quote, the grammatical exclusion of Muslims, 
The problem is that neither Meister nor Assad ever really divest themselves of the suspicion that the secular embrace of a Judeo-Christian past is really just the reiteration of an older Christian perspective on the theological place of the Jews in Christendom, that it's a kind of redescription, a supersessional redescription of Christianity itself. Um, in this light, I approach Jewish survival neither as a Jewish nor as a Judeo-Christian question, but instead as a counterintuitive index for the way that survival uh, explains, refracts the secularized forms of Christianity that mark modernity in the West. Of course, versions of this claim are by now familiar. Few philosopher, philosophers of religion, for example, would be surprised to learn that Christianity provides the inescapable backdrop to Western philosophy. The same statement could apply as much to individual thinkers explicitly involved in projects like de-theologization as it could to more abstract and far-reaching endeavors to unearth the theological traces at play in something like modern political economy. And yet the stark obviousness of Christianity's significance has not necessarily led to any further clarity on the kind of ob object or subject that Christianity is, which is to say that even the most sophisticated genealogical work sometimes struggles to contain the slippages between Christianity and a host of other historically freighted terms, um, not the least of which would be the word religion, this translation between Christianity and religion. Um, in order to open this up in a different way, um, I borrow from a term that Jacques Derrida coined um, toward the end of his career, namely global Latinization this kind of neologism that attempts to combine um, Latin Christianity with the centuries long process of universalization um, that Derrida also calls globalization. What this also implies uh, for me, what this term global Latinization implies is that the question I've been asking who is speaking about religion cannot ignore the fact that the name survival as with the name religion um, we, are, we are already speaking Latin. So my genealogy begins also as an investigation into the history of translation as it makes its way from Rome in terms like superstare, supervivere, to Europe, survival, uh, survi, uberleben, to the United States, in English again, survival, and has become part again of our current political horizon. To borrow a quote from Saba Mahmoud, one might say that survival is symptomatic of the fundamental centrality of Christian norms, values, and sensibilities, however Judaic they are made out to be, to European conceptions of what it means to be secular. So one final question um, before I end, how does this work in the book? As I've said, um, I looked at a series of canonical writers, um, Hannah Arendt, Walter Benjamin, Franz Rosenzweig, and Sigmund Freud. And again, the question is why these um, canonical and familiar names? So just a few comments on that choice. In choosing them, I'm compelled by two strategies. First, because the work of Arendt, Rosenzweig, and Freud has been so central to the post-war expression of Jewish survival, their writings are also effective sites for provisionally disarticulating these two terms, Jewish and survival. Second, because the writings of Arendt, Benjamin and Freud have circulated well beyond the discourse on Jewish survival and become major resources in the propagation of survival talk across geographic and topical contexts. They can also serve as occasions for re re reorienting um, along global Latin lines, um, survival's theological political genealogy. Um, just two quick examples. In the chapter, or actually we'll stay with one example. In the chapter on Arendt, which begins the book, um, my claim is that survival, this word survival runs like a red thread through the book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, stringing together its intersecting analyses of anti-Semitism, imperialism, and totalitarianism. And so through a comparative reading of these sections and the respective representations of Jewish survival, what Arendt, what Arendt calls Jewish survival, African survival, and European survival, I established Arendt's text as a kind of digest for thinking about survival's theological political archive. I do this across each section 
um, until the story culminates in a striking image that Arendt borrows from a number of figures in her own time that <clears throat> finds the description of the concentration camps in which um, the figure of the survivor is Lazarus, um, saved and resurrected from the ruin of a ghostly realm that Arendt herself and a uh, kind of racializing narrative that has been picked up by others um, continually compares to quote, the dark continent. And so survival becomes a way of thinking about how a series of things, religion, race, sovereignty, um, and so forth, um, can be thought within the history of a Christian theological political archive and what some of those elements might look like. Um, I will stop here um, and uh, we can begin the discussion. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Well, there's a, a lot to take up in what you say and a lot to take up in the book. I appreciate having read it and I appreciate the attempt to um, save Jews from survival. It's a loaded term as you show, it's loaded in a whole bunch of different ways. In fact, it seems as you read through the book, you discover that it is connected to so many different um, problematic projects, you could say, that I begin to wonder, and this is my first question to you. Um, it's a general question, and then I wanna to get to some specifics in the book. What's the alternative? Have you thought of the real work that this term does for people in valorizing their experience? I see it as, and I'm with you in your critiques all the way through. I can see exactly where it comes from. Um, but I see it as an indicator of an unsettled relationship to finitude. That is the accounts have not been settled on one's own limitations and also on the death of others. And survival is, as you show at times, a triumphant response and at times a melancholic response. And it oscillates between the two, but it does do that work. Right, so yes, this is, this is, um... This is a crucial question, I think, um, which I'm understanding um, in two ways. One is that the way that um, survival captures both these triumphant moments and this melancholic moments, or even say ghostly moments, um, as I talk about in some um, portions of the book. And so <clears throat> um, if survival is doing this kind of important work, if it's capturing not just one particular figure, but a whole range of possibilities, say in a reaction to finitude or reaction to the death of others, then um, is there an alternative or should we hold on to survival for some reason? Um, and I think um, that's completely possible. It's possible to make an argument that we should hold on to survival as doing some kind of work. My sense is that um, actually, um, even in places like the pop popular media, there's something um, pushing against um, survival and even the figure of the survivor, um, not simply because of the um, content um, that it holds, but also um, perhaps because of the um, affect that it creates or the obviousness of the terms that it brings together. For one thing, um, I think it still is um, related to a kind of post-Holocaust discourse that um, uh, um, has certain familiar images, certain familiar um, uh, figurations um, that have come to color all sorts of things, um, as I point out in the introduction related to the Cold War and, and so forth. Um, and the question is whether um, beginning elsewhere um, is possible. And this is something that I suggest um, uh, at the end of the book um, with an attempt, um, with a kind of um, displacement of translation to think um, outside the history of um, uh, um, Latin Christianity and in relation to a series of uh, kind of figure of translation in, in Hebrew and Arabic that would provide not necessarily a post-war American or post-Holocaust orientation, um, but maybe a kind of post-colonial, decolonial orientation to thinking about some of the similar questions of infi uh, finitude and so forth that you bring up. Just one other example though. I think survival also creates a kind of problematic bind. Um, there are two recent books that I've found helpful in thinking about this. One is a kind of ongoing project summarized recently by Mahmoud Mamdani, um, where he tries to suggest that what's so important about the figure of the survivor in say post-genocidal context 
is the way that it overcomes the difference between victim and perpetrator. And that it can actually, for that reason, be a kind of reconciliatory term for thinking about um, <clears throat> those who have been in, uh, um, um, survived um, uh, a genocidal uh, context. On the other hand, there's another book that's come out recently um, by um, C. Heike Schotten, a scholar in Boston, um, who suggests that the triumphalism of the survivors, survivors always connected somehow to settler colonial movements or the triumph of the survivor as um, the triumph of the perpetrator always in some way, this overcoming of victimhood, the death of others, the denial of the passivity of victimhood. And so for that reason, you're caught somehow in a double bind. What kind of work is survival doing? Is it a kind of productive agency or is it a denial of um, another mode of subjectivity um, that wouldn't have that triumphalism kind of baked into it. Yeah, that's a great point. Maybe we could talk then about your reading of, of Agamben and um, the idea of the Musulman. This becomes, so the book takes you through a whole series of uh, versions of survival. I can just read some of them survival of, as you said, the savage, quote unquote, which is a, a shocking revelation about Arendt's uh, thought of what she calls the dark continent, the Fortleben or the living forth of texts in Benjamin, the imitation of Christ in Rosenzweig, the Eucharistic presence of the absent body of God, which also shows up as a gesture of media and so on. There's a number of them, but then you get towards the end to, um, the question of a social relationship where the survivor is always a survivor with relationship to someone whose um, life doesn't count, even if they survive. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thanks, uh, Paul. Um, can you just tell me what, um, what um, point you're referring to um, uh, okay. at the end? I'm trying to find it here in my various notes. Uh, I think I'm talking about. I can answer in relationship to Agamben if that. If Why that don't helps. you do that and then I'll look for my. Yeah, my I notes. mean, so, right. So, you know, you know, famously um, Agamben makes this argument about um, survival in remnants of Auschwitz as a uh, kind of um, actually uh, intervention into this famous difference that Foucault suggests between making die and making live, Agamben suggests to make survive as a kind of mechanism of differentiation between, say, survivors on the one hand and what he calls uh, the Muslim or uh, the Muslim in Auschwitz, which has been, of course, written about um, extensively. And what I try to do is not so much disagree with Agamben, but suggest that his own genealogical work in Remnants of Auschwitz ends up creating kind of distinction between the theological, um, say the remnant of the, the remnant, the remnant of Israel um, and the biopolitical, which he associates with survival. But that his actual genealogy of survival, although alluding at moments to a theological heritage, never really doubles down on that um, and keeps these two things separate, the biopolitical and, and the theological. Mm -hmm. And what I try to suggest then is that um, oddly enough, um, maybe not, uh, oddly, I don't know. Um, one can actually think about um, the way that Franz Rosenzweig's um, book written um, well before the context that um, Agamben is writing about um, already seems to be um, um, working across similar lines um, in the sense that um, the survivor has this triumphalist aspect to it, that um, the Muslim is coded according to a particular history of uh, despotism that marks the Muslim with uh, death, and that the entire um, discourse um, of survival in Rosenzweig's book somehow circles around his understanding of the body of Christ. And so in that sense, um, Rosenzweig's book becomes a kind of supplement, a, I don't know, retrospective supplement uh, to um, Agamben's work to suggest that this isn't maybe about um, uh, uh, the Holocaust itself, but there's an older lineage um, uh, for thinking about the way that the language of survival mediates um, our reception of things like um, 
those whose lives matter, or those whose don't lives don't matter, uh -huh. um, as you put it, as you put it earlier. I see. So just to go a little further with the distinction between the theopolitical use of the term and reception from uh, Christian theological paths, which you trace back to pseudo Dionysus and Neoplatonism um, and the biopolitical, I can see very much the stakes with the biopolitical, which is a term invented by Foucault in late lectures to talk about the way uh, governments manage biological life of their um, of the governed. And so um, the idea of survival in a biopolitical realm could issue in violence against the physical life of certain members of a community. It's a kind of logic of sacrifice there. What are the stakes of the theopolitical? Is it just that people are crypto Christians like Hannah Arendt or Benjamin maybe less and they're waiting for uh, an afterlife, a perfect life? In some sense, you suggest this in Rosenzweig's, the end of Rosenzweig's book, where one goes into life that has to be shorn of all its other characteristics. It's hard to know what that is. What are the stakes of the theopolitical reading? What are we, what are we losing there? Well, well, let me let me answer this question in two ways. So the first thing to say is that I don't I don't know that that um, Arendt, Benjamin. These, these figures are exactly crypto Christian. Um, the, or at least my attempt is not to sort of make a challenge toward any kind of identity claim. Um, what I'm actually trying to suggest is that the identity claim sometimes predetermines or overdetermines the way that we read these texts. And that in fact, um, one can read books by Arendt, by Benjamin and so forth as helping to um, assemble this theological political archive, um, especially um, in, or particularly in regard to survival. Um, the stakes, um, I think, um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, and as I was um, uh, suggesting as well in the opening remarks, is that survival is already, um, one could say, um, theological, if you uh, read um, the link between Jews and survival as uh, marking survival in some way with religion or theology. And in fact, there's a whole tradition, both in modern scholarship and in older scholarship, of trying to read um, Jewish theology, the history of Jewish textual tradition through the language of survival. And so the stakes for me are to disarticulate these things and um, suggest that um, the language of survival actually emerges um, um, not only from a Christian theological tradition, but um, actually captures um, Jews as a theological category through um, the language of survival, through the Augustinian tradition and so forth. And it's this, um, we call it a theological political reorientation, but also a geopolitical reorientation to the extent that terms like Judeo-Christian, um, I think, um, gloss over um, the stakes of thinking about um, um, what it might mean to um, set um, uh, Jewishness off, or the history of Jewish textual tradition, whatever it might be, off from um, the kind of obviousness of survival as a, a link between them. No, I think it's a it's a great discovery and it's really useful for understanding how one is read through the other. Um, I guess I would say, and I wonder if you agree here, that um, it's a particular interpretation of a relationship to loss, a recuperative relationship. And I can see how the structures that you bring in to understand survival, the Eucharist, the passion of Christ, God as the ultimate überlebende, survivor who has eternal life. And then you raise the wonderful question, well, what is, what is life? It really depends what you mean by life when you're saying someone survives. I think of um, Soma Morgenstern, who was a, a friend of Benjamin's who came to New York after the war and he had survived, but he, he really didn't feel like that word was the right word. It felt like the most thin of existences. Um, so, well, I wanna ask what you think about that as a, um, a certain interpretation of loss. And again, if you have an alternative that you wanna propose. Right, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's, that's right. Um, um, in all of the examples um, 
that I give, um, it's structured in some way around this question of, of loss. Um, and things like the Eucharist, um, God's uh, survival, so forth, are reactions to this possibility of finitude and um, loss. Um, so the question I think for me is not whether um, survival is so much a good description of this question of loss. Um, as you say, it does a lot of, uh, does a lot of work. Um, but for me, I think the question is how um, central um, this question of survival becomes in relationship to loss for understanding subjectivity in general. And to me, that's not a clear um, leap. And certainly um, the Freudian tradition, even up through um, uh, contemporary theory, Judith Butler and so forth, um, this link say between melancholia, triumphant melancholia and the constitution of, of the subject, I think is something that should just at least be you know, thought about um, in, in this genealogical way. And so um, while I do propose a kind of alternative at some point, um, my goal, my preliminary goal with the book is to raise these questions as perhaps being more contingent than um, they would sometimes suggest. Um, and so the next step then would be to think about um, what an alternative might look like, though I, I will leave that to uh, scholars more more ambitious than I. Yeah. Maybe I'll just ask you one more question, and that's about maybe the most peculiar and complicated figure of survival in your book, and that is, I think, Benjamin's idea of the Fortleben of a text, the living forth of a text into its Nachreife, its post ripeness or the ripeness of its post age. This is certainly not a triumphant triumphalist view and it's, it is um, not really about human beings in any of the senses as quasi theological beings as imitations of Christ. How do you see that fitting in? Right. So um, I think you're right. I think um, the chapter on Benjamin is a, is a, is, stands in an interesting relationship to the chapter that precedes it, Arendt, which is about um, political questions and so forth. And um, some of the theological work that I do in the rest of the book afterwards, um, specifically in relate, relationship to things uh, concerning Christ's body and the Eucharist and so forth. Um, for me, um, Benjamin does a couple things. One is that um, to the extent that there is a, a contemporary philosophical discourse about survival, um, it emerges um, in a strange way um, um, in relationship to Benjamin's text uh, on um, translation, this, this apparent distinction. It's not even clear Benjamin makes a distinction, but um, Derrida has suggested at some point that there was a distinction between um, Fortleben and Überleben, and that one could map these along different, different lines, living, living on versus living after. Um, so for one thing, um, that linguistic difference um, and its afterlife in contemporary philosophy was helpful for orienting the problem as one of translation. That one of the issues with survival is that I wanted to use translation to make it less transparent as a category and think about the way that across languages, um, translation creates problems for thinking about exactly what mm -hmm. survival is doing. Um, but in doing that, what I try to show um, is that as much as Benjamin writes about the, the Fortleben of the text, um, uh, Überleben somehow has a less clear uh, set of uses. Um, and yet what I try to suggest is that the term Überleben itself or that Benjamin's text is an opportunity for thinking about the history of um, the translation of that word and the way that Benjamin uses it. Um, and that there are ways of reading Benjamin's text, especially toward the end um, with the notion of a kind of performative language um, that um, is translatable less as survival or translatable as survival, but in the particular sense of kind of hyper life or super life. Mm -hmm. um, and what I try to show, as you mentioned, is that um, my hypothesis is that this can actually trace back um, to uh, um, the texts of Pseudo Dionysius, where the idea of super life. Um, is a description of God's sovereignty, sort of apophatically, you know, registered, um, but um, that this construction, um, Uba Leben, as, as hyper life, um, one can actually follow a history of translation 
through mm -hmm. translations of Pseudo Dionysius's texts into German. So um, Benjamin does some some work for me linguistically and um, archivally, I would say. Yeah, I guess I'm in preparation for the rest. Right. I found it a really interesting chapter. And you come back to Benjamin later to talk about the aura as a form of survival. I guess I would say that one valence of survival is this again in a kind of particular spot in a Christian tradition that there's some precious stuff, call it spirit, that is carried over. But Benjamin, when he comes to it, really thinks nothing is carried over. That's the interesting part of it, that the translation touches the original at a certain part, but there isn't a preservation there. So it, it could offer another, another model where instead of surviving, you're in fact departing from a certain spot. <laughs> um, right, no, I, 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 think, I think this is right. And um, um, I mean, you know, obviously people like um, Sam Weber and so forth have kind of opened up this term for Laban in interesting ways and um, this departing from a text and into the text of another and so forth. And I, I think these, I think these readings are of Benjamin are all um, correct. Um, um, what's interesting actually is in that chapter, um, in the particular valence that Uwe Leben takes on is it's actually not clear that it's about preservation at all. Um, um, and that in some sense, um, it's an attempt to actually understand what it would mean to have a language without content that preserves nothing, but is actually creative um, as a uh, creative in some um, uh, powerful way. Um, and this is what I, what I think it does for um, thinking about this term Uwe Leben um, um, and its um, difference, if it is one, um, from the way that Fought Leben tracks this becoming other of a text across the rest of um, the essay. Well, terrific. Thank you for talking with me. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. No, thank, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. It's a total pleasure. I'm going to turn to the Q&A now and I will, I'm going to, um, well, since I didn't ask whether people wanted to be named, I guess I won't name the people who, who are asking, but I will ask your questions. Here's a question about Christianity as a question and which is the Christianity you're talking about? Uh, he wants to know, or she wants to know, um, what is the state of the Christian question in your work? Um, yes, it, it remains a question, um, or at least um, I think um, um, if uh, um, my understanding of uh, the state of the Christian question is correct, is that um, it is a question that um, um, maybe is um, uh, still uh, burgeoning, st strangely enough, that it still needs to be asked um, in a particular way. And um, my hope then is that um, this question of survival is a way of opening up um, what that question might be, um, theological, political, um, economic, representational. Um, Paul and I didn't have a chance to talk about media, but one of the frames for thinking about the survivor or the figure is thinking about survival actually in relationship to things like um, absence and presence as they appear in both contemporary media and then um, historically in debates about representation in Christianity. So, um, uh, so yes, so um, survival is, is a way I would say of posing, of posing this question and keeping it open as a question. Okay, I'm going to go on to another question. This one says, in the opening of your book, you identify the Jew with survival. The genealogy of survival, she'erit, can look differently and less Christian if originated in the Jew as a stranger, quote unquote. In modernity, the lineage arises from Zimmel via Buber, Benjamin and Arendt, etc. The stranger may point towards a different ethics and theopolitics of survival than the Christianized reading by Agamben. Curious to hear your thoughts. So the, the question is, is whether the stranger is a um, potentially more productive figure than survival? It seems that there is a survival attached to the stranger and it might have a different ethics associated with it. Um, it might, I don't know. I don't, I, I haven't, I haven't thought too much about the stranger, but it's um, an interesting, uh, 
it's an interesting pairing with um, survival. Um, um, I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Um, I don't have anything um, it is true concrete to say about the moment. In your portrayals, the survivor, except maybe for Benjamin, is always our survivor, the survivor of our group, a survivor that, that belongs somewhere and that carries the belonging with them even into a, an alien territory, exiles for one. Right, I mean, um, this, this reminds me, um, this is helpful actually. Um, you, uh, you know, one, one question that, that um, the question of political theology of survival brings up um, um, in relationship to um, kind of famous things uh, in the field, uh, the King's Two Bodies and so forth, is the degree to which survival is actually a, uh, is always a, a function of a community, um, the self and the other, um, multiplicity and individuality. And so thinking about what the stranger might be in relationship to the way that survival always forms a community of say inclusion and exclusion could be an interesting way of thinking about um, opening that up, but I'd have to give it a little bit more thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you write in, a, in chapter four on the sovereign about figures of sovereignty, even in the age of pure sovereignty, absolute sovereignty as being kind of survivors of God. And in a sense, the sovereign has to survive into modernity. Sovereignty does in other forms. The one Christ who says, this is my body, the sovereign who says, l'état c'est moi, has to take different forms in modernity. And already that you show is active in Hamlet, where you do a marvelous reading of Hamlet. Um, I wonder if you think those forms are um, proliferating, if you see them in places as you look around now, uh, the ones that call back to a theological model that are the gods überleben in disguise. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to keep this on an, um, a bit of a theoretical level, but um, I have been wondering recently, um, and I, I'm actually not sure I'm committed to this claim, so I'll be curious to hear what you think, Paul, but um, you know, one way of talking about the one popular way um, coming out of Foucault for talking about the difference between epochs of, say, power would be sovereignty um, as a kind of singular form, and then something like um, to make, uh, so, so you have to make die and let live versus to make live and let die. But if um, in the classical absolutist sovereign sense, the sovereign is already a kind of Eucharistic body um, it's already making live. Um, the community is already um, um, sustained in some way by um, by the king's body. So it it is possible that um, uh, um, the very periodization that Foucault uses is actually bound up some way with um, uh, this um, strange history of the king's three bodies or four bodies or however many bodies it may yeah. have. Yeah, I guess in Europe, the French Revolution would be a good turning point there. If this, the sovereign can carry the survival problem of God for the people, the people are really free. But once the people have to carry it and have to continually um, support the sovereign through their will, then you have to make the people survive. <clears throat> it's a thought. I'm going back to the questions. Um, Yes, the question is, could you talk a little bit or does your book talk about the etymologies and differing linguistic histories of the Latinate versions of survival and the Germanic terms that aren't Benjamin Rosenzweig use, überleben, fortleben, what are the important differences and could you talk about them? Right, so um, it does. Um, um, so the differences between um, uh, say uh, German, French and English appear throughout to the extent that I'm reading texts that um, move through these languages. Um, the um, Latin distinctions are interesting as well. Um, I actually, I developed this a little bit less um, in the book than elsewhere, but um, um, etymologically and people like Ben Venice and so forth, the, the term survival has, has often been linked to um, superstition or superstare. Um, and so there's actually a kind of dual and sort of unclear etymology of where um, the English term or the French term um, survival comes from. And it hasn't really been, um, it hasn't really been 
looked at, I think, from, from a historical linguistic standpoint. But um, much like religion, um, there's a kind of uh, doubling of survival genealogy that remains unclear as to the um, um, source, super vivere, super star. And I bring this out um, somewhat in the book, but um, um, focus more on one than the other. Here's another question towards Benjamin about super life, hyper life, and translation. Is the super life of a text not its survival, but its fracture? Is fracture a different mode of survival that departs from the Christian theological imposition? Um, that sounds possible. Yes, I, I mean, I, I would, I would need to think about, I would need to think about that a little bit more um, in relationship to Benjamin's text. Um, I mean, the claim about um, the claim about the term Uberleben in um, in the uh, Benjamin's task of the translator essay is that actually he's borrowing the way that he uses the term in his essay on romanticism as um, a kind of um, higher life, um, but that this isn't necessarily the higher life of the text. It's the um, uh, um, moment at the very end of the essay when um, Benjamin tries to articulate the um, uh, holy text or holy uh, the Bible as a text that doesn't need to be translated because it's already um, it's already freely translating in some kind of in the sense that it actually produces language as opposed to um, uh, is derivative in some way um, and so Uberleben is um, stands there. And so this question of fracture across the rest of the essay, um, it would be interesting to read those two moments more in tension than I do um, in the text and think about whether that question of fracture could depart in some way from, from um, the link between sovereignty and Uberleben, their wholeness. Okay, here's a, here's a question. Thank you. Um, this is a question about language, another one with a lot of interest in this. Okay. Yeah. If you premise the book upon the question, who is speaking about survival? This viewer is wondering about the preposition about, can you separate language and speaking as a medium of articulation from survival as its object? Wouldn't the speaking and the language be a form of survival? Following Benjamin Blanchot, Derrida, Hamacher. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about survival before talking about the survival structure of talking? Um, Right, I think I think um, that sounds um, right to me. Though, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, there seems to be a kind of um, uh, say fraught opposition between um, what do we mean to think about survival as a um, particular word, term, part of a particular language, a particular translation history, and what do I mean to generalize survival um, as a kind of universalizing structure for what it means to speak in the first place. And um, obviously in the book, I take the kind of first tack. I think that um, Derry Dawes um, uh, um, sort of 30 year project of generalizing survival has its own strategies um, behind it that survival can't be understood necessarily the kind of exceptional position but needs to be understood um, um, uh, as a kind of substructure for thinking about um, language life in general, um, um, which is um, which is very interesting, I think, um, and in some ways um, the inspiration for the way that this book works. Um, but I try to um, go in a different direction by thinking about um, how even that generalization operates perhaps within a particular closure or particular history of say metaphysics, Christ theology, Christianity. Um, and so in that sense, um, it would try to provisionalize this claim about the generalization of survival as a structure of speaking. Right. Um, if I'm, again, if I'm understanding this question. Yeah, I agree. It would seem to me that it's begging the question to impose survival on language. But it's true, the questioner is right, that there is a kind of circular issue there. And maybe um, it really depends on whether we can speak differently out of our past, that is to use language differently before we can start to talk about survival differently. I wanna ask you now, I think we've come to the end of our questions for now, but people are welcome to ask a few more. We have a few minutes left. I wanna ask you about psychology because 
there's a lot of, first of all, psychological attachment to the idea of survival, but psychology is imagined in Freud as you deal with him as a kind of survival from childhood. Um, you talk about trauma as one model of this. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between the psychiatric invention of the concept of the survivor by Robert J. Lifton, which you address in your prologue, your introduction, and Freud's trying to come to terms with rests and revenants and remainders that seem to structure the psyche. Right, so I th I'm gonna try to answer this question a little bit um, uh, obliquely, I think, um, which is that one of the arguments of the book um, is that um, already in Freud's lifetime, but really in the post-war period, um, people like Lifton, but then also important trauma theorists like Kathy Carruth and, and so forth, um, use survival to describe a whole series of um, things um, that emerge out of psychoanalysis. And um, um, the question I wanna ask is whether um, survival actually as a term is a Freudian concept, which is to say in Freud's text is survival a concept like say the reality principle or the death drive, um, something that Freud reflects on as a particular category in need of um, further examination. And the turn then to this, um, I read a, a short dream um, that Freud looks at um, in the interpretation of dreams um, is um, a place where he actually is invested in the language of um, Überleben or actually works um, with a particular um, word um, as opposed to it being imposed on the Freudian corpus. And what emerges from that is this kind of strange transferential dialectic between a kind of search for uh, sovereign triumphalism, what it means to stand um, um, at a grave over the loss of a loved one, um, and the sense that actually um, um, there are no sovereign singular individuals. We are all kind of ghostly uh, replications of um, everyone else and that this is Freud's great anxiety. Um, and so the question for me then is with Freud is um, to try to um, think linguistically or in terms of translation about um, how important survival has become to thinking about psychoanalysis in the post-war period. Um, and again, in figures like Carruth, how it's often linked to um, Jewish survival, that much of um, the potent force of that comes out of a reading of Moses and monotheism. And so I try to move this back and suggest that Freud's actually working with a um, series, a kind of Christian archive in that particular moment in the dream. Yeah, the dream is really spectacular. Maybe I'll just say a little about it. We can talk about the dream to close out the session. Freud has a dream in, in which he is in the laboratory of his former teacher. He hears a knock on the door and a dead professor, Fleischl, is there. Incidentally, it's a fleshy visitor whose name is Flesh, basically little flesh. And Freud goes through meeting a whole set of people who have caused him trouble, including Fleece, who is his kind of ego ideal and bête noire. Um, and he's gripped by strange effects. He sees a, a sign that says non vixit. And he ends up thinking that Fleischl had been only an apparition or revenant. It's a very complicated dream, which you carry through the rest of the chapter. Um, it seems to me that whatever there is about survival here is really about rivalry. In a sense, you were saying that. And I wonder if there's a real cynical reading of survivor here, which is something like, uh, it is an imagined uh, escape from struggle or an imagined mm, triumph, I guess, in the way we've been talking about it, but now in a social sense where you could come out on top without actually having to, you know, you just kill everybody and it's a death wish. Right, right. No, I think I think it's this kind of dream, uh, maybe it's a terrifying dream, but dream of absolute sovereignty somehow for Freud in this um, rivalrous um, mode, as you've been saying. 
Um, and I think, you know, um, in terms of the reception of Freud, this is, this is more or less um, um, Kennedy's strange post-war assessment of the survivor, not that the survivor is a victim that needs to be um, thought of, uh, uh, not in the sense of a victim, but actually um, mankind's worst evil as uh, quote unquote, as he puts it in that um, book, as, which he's taking from Freud, the, the survivor as this triumphant sovereign figure um, dreaming of killing all of those uh, around. Um, and it's, this has a, a kind of reception as well into um, people like uh, Mbembe and Cavarero and so forth. So this, this peculiar language of sovereign survivalism in Freud um, has its own kind of resonance into the present, I think. And this dream, I think, is one place where you really see that happen. There is, as usual in Freud, there's a beautiful attack of conscience in that the repressed survives, but it always comes back as something else. So there's a disturbing element to survival that mm -hmm. is, doesn't allow you to triumph over anything ever. Right, before. right. And I don't know if you would call this survival exactly if something survives as something that it never was. And at a certain point, um, you or he talk about, I think it's Freud who talks about this either as a childhood memory or, or the stuff of psychoanalysis or as a fantasy. So I wonder if you would just help us end by talking about um, the kind of affective <coughs> and phantasmatic attachments to the idea of survival. Um, it seems to me that um, it has a lot and it does a lot of work psychologically, even if not um, in the way that Lifton imagined I don't know if you consider that at all or think about mm -hmm. testimonies, um, but I wonder if you could talk about that. Can you say a little, little more, Paul? What, what um, sounds like you, you have a, a thought about, uh, about this? Well, I mean, in a way, um, uh, I'm thinking that um, you do this great job of genealogizing and showing, here's a good example, um, and showing how these uh, German Jewish, marginally Jewish, marginally German figures who have um, vexed relationships to both take up this term and how this offers a really good backdrop for maybe changing our attachment to survivor for the mm -hmm. um, Shoah discourse. But it does seem also that there are let's say positive dialectical moments to it. And it allows you to process something or put something in a, in a particular place that as you say, it holds on to complexity um, uh, as Freud is gripped by strange affects. In a sense, it, because nobody knows what it means really, it's an ambiguous, highly ambiguous term and it might be doing the work of maintaining the ambiguity like the repressed does, the, the term keeps coming back. I wonder if you have a sense of what its positive work is for, let's say, post Shoah understanding. Right. I mean, I think you know, even even historically, to the extent that that um, some significant work has been done on thinking about this in the um, post Holocaust period, um, it, you know, it, it's related to it's related to agency. These it, you know, uh, this idea, perhaps um, in certain contexts in the post-war period, you have a kind of lack of resistance, um, you know, quote unquote, sheeps to the slaughter kind of um, accusations um, mm -hmm. or perhaps collaboration, but negatively tinged and survival provided a kind of agency for thinking about what it, what it might mean to um, um, find strength in moments of um, suffering and so forth. Um, so yeah, so I mean, survival has, has this, this, um, um, and as you said, because it's so ambiguous, it holds together so much that um, it has this, this flexibility to be used in all sorts of different contexts, different ways, um, not just extreme historical situations, but even in, in everyday life. Um, I guess my concern um, effectively is that while the discourse on the survivor, survival is tied to a particular um, context, it kind of colonizes the whole field, right? If, if it's so ambiguous and it takes up 
um, so much perpetrator and victim, ghostly uh, multiplicity and singularity. Um, it ends up being an organizing frame for thinking about, um, um, as I said earlier, subjectivity in general um, in some way. And the question is whether it really has exhausted in some way um, all of the dialectical possibilities or if um, there's something affectively uh, familiar about the term survival and the figure of the survivor um, and that doing this genealogical work could provide um, a kind of um, set of boundaries for thinking about um, what it might mean to speak in different terms, even if it's in uh, say non-Latinate languages. Um, are there other, um, other uh, uh, discourses that have their own poetics their own, say, materialism about them um, that aren't, um, that don't produce the same kind of images as um, survival does in, in their familiarity, at least. So that's that's um, that's my sense of the the issue. Seems like a great place to close. Yeah, I want to say thank you so much to both of you. Um, that was just a really uh, fascinating discussion, and you know, to Adam. I, you know, I, I've just only started the book, but it's, um, it, it's such, it's such an interesting book and you describe, you explain the, the, these concepts in such a lucid way. It's really, really a triumph. And I think, um, I really recommend to everyone interested in these questions. Um, I think it's really going to be just an important book. So congratulations on that. And I just want to end by uh, giving a little plug for our next uh, anti-Semitism event, which is Alex Ross, the music critic of The New Yorker, is going to be uh, talking to us about Wagner and anti-Semitism, co-sponsored by the German department. Again, so thank you uh, to Paul for that. And that is going to be on uh, Wednesday, April 28th. So you should all get the um, uh, call to register for that. And I hope to see you then. Thank you again to Adam, to Paul, to all of you. And uh, you. have a good evening.